I'm very happy to be introducing uh, Johnny Houston as a speaker. Uh, Houston is a professor emeritus at Elizabeth, State, Elizabeth City State University. He received his BA from Morehouse College, his MS from Clark Atlanta University, and his PhD from Purdue University, where he wrote his dissertation under the supervision of Eugene Shankman. And I was uh, especially pleased um, to have our invited speaker being an alumnus of Clark Atlanta University, as that's also where James Solomon received his master's degree. Professor Houston is an accomplished mathematician, educator, and administrator. At ECSU, uh, he became Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs in 1984, and in 1988, he was named Senior Research Professor by the University. Outside of ECSU, he is the co-founder of the National Association for Mathematicians, uh, serving as the first acting president uh, and uh, as executive secretary from 1975 to 2000. Uh, he was uh, nationally selected by the Oral History Project, the History Makers, to be interviewed as a science history maker. And uh, you can learn more about his life and accomplishments um, by watching uh, the interview on their website, uh, The History Makers. Um, I hope you um, watch that after the talk, and uh, I'll now invite uh, Houston up to speak. Thank you. It is my honor to have been invited to this August occasion. I am very happy that the University of South Carolina decided to honor Mr. Solomon and to permit me to be a part of that honor by giving this recognition lecture today. There's something that I might um, mention. Well, you're going to learn much about Mr. Solomon because they have a nice display and several things here which will tell about uh, the things he's done for the community and the university in South Carolina. And so I will not go into that. That will happen after my speech and they can, you can learn about all of those things at that time. And so I, was, um, I want to thank um, Professor Cass for the introduction. I want to thank the department and the committee for selecting me. And I don't know what I should thank him or whether I should uh, punch a hole in his top. But uh, my friend, Dr. Edward Goin, who is president of the National Association of Mathematicians, I understand that he told them to consult me about this. And so he put another thing on my platter that I'm trying to clear. And I'm also happy to have here with me uh, my wife, uh, Virginia Houston. Uh, she uh, is setting a record this year. Uh, she is competing with NAM, the National Association of Mathematicians. Whether we, I had, I had not mentioned to you or not, but. NAM is having its 50th anniversary. It was founded 50 years ago in 1969. And she and I married 50 years ago in 1969. So, what I'd like to know is uh, are there family members of Mr. Solomon in the audience? And so, would you raise your hand or say something? I'm, I'm happy that you were able to come. Uh, I regret that he's not here, but I'm sure you will deliver a good message back to him. And if things are blurred, just tell him it was the machinery, not the lecture, who <laughs> made things bad. And, and so we, we will move forward on that. Now, I, I have a, I, I, I must know, I was told that they didn't know who my audience would be. But I had to speak to my audience. I said, if you don't know, how, how do I know who to speak to? So I prepared a presentation that I'm hoping will give everybody a reason to say, why did I lose my 40 or 45 minutes listening to that? Hope you say, hey, I learned something. That's what I hope you mean to say. So I must ask this question. How many persons in the audience have been privileged to see, receive education in mathematics at the level of bachelor's degree or higher. Mm, very good. 
then, then I, I have, I can speak up, I can speak things up. Now, how many people have no degrees in mathematics and don't plan to get a degree in mathematics? <laughs> I will speak to you as well. So we're going that direction. So let us move along very quickly to see um, where things can go and where we will be. The uh, first thing is, oh, they have sent me in the wrong direction here. I have to go back to the beginning. We were playing with this machine for other reasons earlier today. And so that's where we stand. So just one minute and we should be straight. The, the first thing I'd like to say to you is, uh, this is a tricky question, but uh, I'm sure we have astute persons in the audience, and anybody who won't, wishes to can do a good job answering it. Uh, if we were to come out and say, what is mathematics? <laughs> who would be the first one to raise the hand? to be able to uh, inform the rest of their colleagues and peers and those people who are uh, here to, to be able to handle that for us. You have no takers. Okay, I don't blame you because there is, there's something very interesting about the subject of mathematics and that is Almost everyone I talk with, whether it's a professional or whether it is with uh, someone who has just run into it accidentally, I get a def different definition when they talk about mathematics. They give me a different definition. So I went to the um, I went to the dictionary, see what they had to say about it, and it said that. This is, I'm um, the, <laughs> it, it talked about mathematics as being an abstract science of numbers, quantity, and space. Mathematics may be studied on its own as pure. Uh, may be applied to other subjects like physics, etc. And it said uh, that's what mathematics was. And I said, great, I, I don't have any problems with that. We, we, we can go with that as mathematics. But I said, let me also offer you my definition for mathematics. And the my definition is the following. I think that from the 50 years I've been dealing with mathematics, I have seen it to be an art, a science, a language, a tool, and it's also a pattern relation that cultivate an ever-expanding group of strategies. And what do those strategies do? Strategies that engage the mind problem solving. Mathematics was designed to solve problems. Uh, and so, and I, it's been a delight for me to be to go through that. But now, take this last definition if you want to tell somebody what mathematics is. There, there is no generally accepted <coughs> definition for mathematics that's universally embraced by all of us. You talk to different people, they're gonna tell you different things. So keep that in mind. And so if you didn't know what it was when you came here, and you don't know what it is when you leave, you're still okay. Because <laughs> all the rest of the people are the same way. Now, there are a lot of people who try to give definitions for mathematics and they talk about some characteristics of the science, of what it is. Um, they talk about it as, uh, as being the king of science, the queen of science. They talk about it as being 
somebody tried to get to say that it was uh, it's microstructure and microstructure. So I think they were trying to let you know that they had taken some other sciences <laughs> when they start talking about it that way. Uh, some people talk about it as being a language. And some people look at it as being uh, deductive reasoning or deductive thinking. And there are all kinds of things they look at it for. The, the science of measurement, one said. Uh, I like this one here by Benjamin Peer. He said, mathematics is a science for drawing necessary conclusions. He said, once you follow the road, follow the language, follow the concept, you come to a conclusion that's going to lead you somewhere that's sound. Uh, but now, Bertrand Russell want to make, make the fight that it's symbolic logic. He, he doesn't want to talk about drawing conclusions. In fact, Bertrand Russell went further to say some other things that I didn't like, but I agree with number 12, where he said, mathematics is a subject which we never know what we're talking about, nor whether what we're saying is true. <laughs> Somebody asked me, what is the point? I can't show you a point. What's a line? I can't show you a line. What's a plane? I can't show you two dimensions. I tell you, go watch the movie Flatland. Uh, if you ask me, what's three dimension? I can't show it to you. But the but there is a pattern of things that happen to make me know that what I'm dealing with is not at random. There's a lot of structure to it, and a lot of things that are going on. Now here's number fourteen that I want you to pay real attention to. All of you. It said that mathematics is the queen of science and arithmetic is the queen of all mathematics. If you don't learn arithmetic, you can't do mathematics. You cannot do mathematics. If you want to talk about range, field, dynamic system, and you cannot add, subtract, multiply, divide, you might as well forget. It doesn't work. <laughs> so everybody has to learn arithmetic. Now, and that's why they tell you that reading, writing, and arithmetic are things that help you to become an educated person and, and be able to move forward with a number of things. Now, I also like the thing that Galileo said. I had a chance to go to Italy, go to the Leon Tower pizza where he had this demonstration, etc. I think he had a great plan. He said, mathematics is the in the broadest sense, it opens, uh, will be opening a gateway and a road to large and excellent science in which minds more piercing than mind can penetrate or understand. And he and I agree on that. It's an ever-expanding science. It, it's not something where we can pour it all in a jar for you and you can take it home it, with your BS degree and pull it out when you need it. If you pull it out five years later, it might not be any good. But you, it is a fine thing to know. But now, since we said there's a, this issue about uh, arithmetic, in fact, I, I love Galileo so that uh, he and I put came with a conjecture together. <laughs> and that is that there is no limit as to how far mathematics and mathematical investigation will expand. Now, if you can disprove us, we have for you one of the grand challenge prize of a million dollars. But you don't get it until I'm dead because it comes in my way. <laughs> so don't ask me for the money, even if you think you have a solution uh, that you can prove, which I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you cannot. But Here's something that parents said that I thought was real common. They said, one parent said, mathematics is about numbers and arithmetic with unbended accuracy and infallible rules. Students should know the basics, but mathematics is such an innate ability. Mathematics is difficult, and so students shouldn't have to be expected to know so much. 
They just need to know enough to get back. And it was ironic that uh, Walmart and a lot of the other uh, stores took that for granted. They don't even let students add anymore. They have these visual machines that does the add and subtract and buy and tell them how much money to give back. So they don't have to use their arithmetic because they went with him. Students don't know very much about it. Now, there's an issue that uh, someone said mathematicians had an image problem. <laughs> you know, they lurked behind all kinds of things and claimed them. But they said, somebody is doing weather forecast. We do that. We gave them that model to do that. They're doing the simulation. We gave them that. They said, they're doing this kind of regression. Now, we gave them the thing to do the, the data mining. So, and then somebody said, oh, they don't mention mathematicians for this. They said, this is what they do. So we, we don't worry about it and we don't uh, move forward. But we do know one thing. Mathematicians do not have a monopoly on the practice and creativity of mathematics. Ordinary people can do it. A judge named Fermat sat upon his desk when he didn't have anything else to do. There's some of the best mathematics in the world. <laughs> not been trained as a mathematician. So we're not there. There was a young man this, in the last few months, find one of the great errors that they have made in the iPhone. He's in high school. He said he's just wrong. And he showed them why it was wrong. Now the Google, the, the expert, are trying to fix it <laughs> and make it right. Well, I'm glad it was the iPhone rather than another airplane because <laughs> air, airplanes destroy people too drastically. Now, what we want to do now is very quickly go through some things to let you know, again, what is mathematics. One of the things is, if you don't know arithmetic, you're not going to make it to mathematics. If you don't know arithmetic, you can't help basic numbers. You can have the best mind in the world, but you're not going to do it to mathematics. Now, we have a, set on a number of systems here that are interesting. And the number system that came about from the way historically people came to know mathematics. And it's the way a child comes to learn a language. They mimic their environment first. And then they get more complex and they move and go forward. Now, see on the left there we talk about natural numbers, talk about zero, and we talk about negative integers. And somebody said, how can integers be negative? Do, do they exist in a hole somewhere where they pour them? No, but sometimes we need them to offset some of the, the positive guys who are too loud. So we can wipe them off the, off the top. Uh, then it goes up to the fact that the, OK. It, it went by to talk about you have you have rational numbers, you have none of these, but you have to learn these numbers. All of complex mathematics is based on the operations and systems for these number systems that people come in contact with early on. If you don't learn these number systems and their operations and what they do and how they do it, I doubt if you will become a, a good mathematician. And, and we try to tell you what these numbers look like so you don't have to go out and look for them. Uh, they will come look for you. There was a, a, a school in, um, in, in uh, Egypt that went around. They found a number that they didn't have an answer for. They didn't know rational numbers existed. And for two or three years, they wouldn't even discuss it with anybody. Because they said, we are a great man. We should know this. But it took another generation, a hundred years for them to understand really what was going on and how rational numbers moved about. And so you have your natural numbers like these, you have your whole numbers, you just add the natural numbers, you count the numbers. Your whole numbers, you count the numbers, you add zero to it. After that, you come up with integers. You add the zero, the, the negative, and you go forward. Then after that, you have your rational numbers. 
where you have fractions, where everything can be expressed as P over Q, an integer over another. But the issue is you can't divide by zero. <laughs> That's what everybody taught us and learned, and, and you better behave that way because if you st start permitting zero to become your denominator, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, it doesn't make. Now, so we do all these things and show people on the line how these numbers look, and they look so nice and pretty on these lines, and you go on until you get to the real number line. And things start creeping up like pi, the square root of two, and all kinds of things there, where you have your irrational. And then it becomes even more fascinating when you jump to the complex plane. When we get out there and talk about the imaginary numbers and A plus B out, and how everything is A plus B and what it must do. But it goes back to the fact that you got to learn these operations. You must learn these operations in your number system in order to do your advanced mathematics. If not, you're not going to do well out like there. Now, when you look at these things, this is where they come up with how you have to follow strict laws in mathematics. And that is, you have to talk about doing certain things first and other things last. Now, so we, we like to talk about when do you do what first. And, uh, and this is where a lot of students get confused. And so I just say, hey, take care of the parentheses first, then your exponents and your square root, then take care of multiplication, then do your division, and then go ahead and do your addition subtraction, and you'll be OK. Because if you do them in another order, you're not going to be OK. So, and, and one person said, I can't remember all that, which way I should do it. And so I said, well, let me go back to the one that most of you come in contact with. Do the MDAS, my dear Aunt Sally. Your multiplication, a division, addition, subtraction. And when you get to your parentheses and roots, you just have to figure it out or go talk to somebody you know. So this is the way we asked them to do. Now, the next thing that happened there was when we got into there, one was you come and talk about what do you need to learn in high school? What do you need to learn in college? Well, they got all kinds of rules. One said you need to learn what common course that you need to learn in high school. Some people say you need to learn this set of courses here in high school. And colleges said, well, you must have these classes before we will admit you to the a thing. So it's a local issue where people make their own decisions. And so what we tell you is a uh, common course that there are about five things you need to learn, but they don't tell you what the contents are. So we don't worry about it. Now, it goes over to and tell you in, in math class, most people use that they have algebra, one, two, geometry, trigonometry, that, and pre-calculus, and Many of them now have had a chance to take AP calculus before they come to college or the university. Good. We, we want them to be uh, our star pupils and so that they might do well. Now, the question is, after high school, what happens? Well, there is a place which tells you not only what the courses should be, but what the content should be. Because we have professors in here who say, I'm going to write my book on geometry. I'm going to write my book on algebra. I'm going to write my book on this. And I, we don't want them misleading students. So we want them to know what contents the students are expected to take when they, when they read their books and when they do their problem solving. Now, when we leave, the, um, when we leave high school, then they're using a set of courses for the baccalaureate degree. There again, we can't agree on it. There are certain courses we do agree, got to have calculus. No, nobody can go get out of a college without calculus. You need some different equation. You need some kind of algebra. You need some kind of like, geometry. Well, we can agree on some things, but we still don't agree on how they should be taught or what the courses are. But they go back and they use those same principles of operations that we talked about in arithmetic to get through all of these things. Now, then you become, you got away from college, you got your baccalaureate degree. Okay, your math major. What are you going to do with it? 
don't know. Well, we tell people now, in college, when I was teaching, it was a part next year, I said, look, double major in something. Try to find out. It's nice to know pure math, but learn how to use it, too, to solve problems. <laughs> because the line is, you solve problems. So I still want internships to tell them to do this so you can learn how to solve problems. Now, when you get to the master's level, we try to get to make sure you got a good foundation, everything is going well, and we usually take about two years of courses. If you're really tight, we'll let you out in one year or the other hand. But, uh, and then with the PhD degree, we tell you, hey, you got to do a little more than just take courses. We want you to be able to understand what some other people have done and how they have, uh, what about doing this. We want you to do some research investigation. We want you to solve some problem. We want you to do something that no one else has done. We said, what? That nobody else has done? You want a PhD, don't you? Well, you better think about it. And I hope you have a nice professor. My professor told me, he said, Houston, uh, I think you're an OK guy, but I want you to know up front, I don't get problems. You got to find your own problem. I said, find my own problem. Why do I have to find my own problem? He said, you want to be, uh, you want a PhD in math, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, you got to find your problem, and you're going to have to have it committed to approve it and come back and make sure you do what you need to do with it. So, what we want to say, okay, that's the, that's the coursework to go through. I said, let me go and see what some of the beauty of math is before I go talk about all that coursework. Because that coursework can be confusing and not clear. So I like the fact that um, we can have what we call a plane, like a, this sheet here, thing here. We can take angles in there and show folks how to do many things in life they do by actually using angles as their guide to help them solve problems. Uh, we have geometric shapes out there that will help you design things and look at them in a certain way and move forward, and you can do a lot of things in a certain way. So here's what we, we want to do to see can we get you moving. So, and we tell you about the nice way you can come up with shapes and curves with conic sections and all kind of things that way and tell you, hey, that's what you, we want you to have done in college and high school. Now, I love, <clears throat> most of you know what a circle is. A circle is you got a center, you got a radius that goes out to the circumference of the circle, and that distance is the same. For every radius, every, all the radius out of the circle are the same in length. But then I, when I got to the ellipse, I loved it because there were two points on that line. And as it went around, they formed a triangle, but they also had the same distance. I said, wow, this is nice. I'm glad somebody got a chance to show me something other than a circle. And so let me do that. And then they started doing things with these solids. Right? You know, they looked at here to talk about Oh, well, we can make all kind of toss out or move around things to see what can happen. I said, okay, that's nice of you, but a Taurus is not anything I can take home or spin, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. And I even took a course in knot theory. Yeah, look at how we could do knots mathematically. I said, why do I need knot theory? But then the Egyptians reminded me. You can do practical things in mathematics. This pyramid in Egypt, for over 3,800 years, it was the tallest structure on Earth. And guess what? It was mathematically sound. It was the largest and oldest three of uh, three pyramids. It was the tallest man-made structure on Earth. And it, it had been around for 3,800 3, years, and not only that, but they had a nice thing there. When you looked at the perimeter around the edge of that thing, it had, if the distance was 365.24. Why are they going to do all that stuff? 
They said that time and date they all have a year. So once you go around it, the year should be over and you should come back with it <laughs> for the next year. And uh, it also had in there how the, you looked at the, the head of it there, you saw that it had a pie over there for the height and the king chamber was made out of a fabric cut. I said, wow, these people know how to do math. And I, and, and I said, hey, everybody should take a pilgrimage to Egypt just to see how they did that. Then people in India said, okay, you got to come to India too. To look at the cemetery here, we know how to deal with what man. Cemetery is where there's a line, and everything on each side of that line mirrors one another. So, do you see the cemetery? Do you see, if you look down, everything on one side is identically like things on the other side? They said, come on, and come see us if you want to do something. But then the other thing that happened was, yeah, in, a, in addition to that, I went to Spain, and they have this building here in Spain. It made in such a way like a, like a ship, and guess what they did? They went about using a computer-aided package to design that building. Architects in the past could not design a building like that, and so that's a museum you might want to look at. They use a pewter computer-aided three-dimensional interactive application packet to design that building, to bring out that beauty for people to be able to see. The other thing that happened was that as we go through this, that there are all kind of natural structures here. We have things like polarines. We have uh, geometric structures in chemistry, and all kind of beauty out there. But, and I went to Mexico. I went down to see what they did on the southern hemisphere. And, and that is a mathematical wonder as well. They did not just build a structure. They showed the next generation that they knew math and what it was all about. They had here where they are believed to be the first people who brought zero in <laughs> to the system. They were also, it's 78 feet tall, and the structure is a castle there, and you have all kind of astrological uh, things there. It has 365 steps, too, like the other one. It has 18 months. They're made in calendar year. It reflects their knowing mathematics and what they can deal with. So I said, hey, that's the way mathematics should be used to, to solve problems and to display beauty. Now, I want to move on. These are some things people have been dealing with, Tyler and other things. And then I heard that there were some number theories might be around. So uh, they did a survey back in 1988 to see what was the most beautiful equation in mathematics. And guess what they came up with? All of the identity as the most beautiful equation in math. So why, why is that so beautiful? Those of you not in man. Don't be bothered with that. But we, we're going to come back to you a little later to show you why that is so important. But in 2018, they changed the most beautiful vision, visual item for mathematician is a fraction. They, they, they changed that. and. Uh, and you see things like this. The Mandelbrot set and the things it can do. And they did 750 million iterations on one of these sets. And you should see what goes on on it. You can sit there for days because of the likeness and similarity as to what people do when they deal with fractions. Now, when you say, what else did they do in mathematics other than show beauty? Well, uh, they show people how to do practical things. For example, there's some neat little things here that anybody can do to show you how to factor pairs of numbers. They came up with structure and order for doing this. And some student, you ask them, say, okay, this is a quadratic equation. How can you break it down into the fact? You didn't tell me how to do it. Well, somebody has come up with some nice rules. 
as to how you can do these kind of things. And so what we are doing here is that in addition to that, you have to have you have this is happening. We want to go back to something ancient, but also something that is very uh We'll go back and see why was all the identity so impressive. Well, it was impressive because those of you who do research, those of you who do high level mathematics, the constants that lurk around all the time are these constants. You find an additive identity, a multiplicative identity, you see the base of a natural logarithm, you see pi for a circle, and you have to have imaginary i for the uh, complex plane. If you don't have these, you can't do work. You can't talk about a field or a dynamical system or a ring if you don't know how to handle these things. Well, work. And you said, how is it that these constants relate to one another? And so people said, wait a minute. I don't know how all of did that. And it was very terrible what I did. I went back and uh, I got nice little views to see what was going on. And somebody told me something I haven't accepted yet. So I'm a theorist in the author, in the audience, they can help me. They said, oh, we didn't even come up with all I did. <laughs> Another guy named Coke came up with the first. <laughs> And not all of them. But he got credit for it. Because the other folks, have you understood why uh, Columbus, America's best Cushions wrote about America, but Columbus is supposed to have discovered it? And nobody, nobody give Columbus credit for all these things of what they what he's supposed to have done. And he didn't discover it anyway. There are so many Indians here and indigenous people that actually he was unkind to them because he took that space and food and everything and still didn't give them recognition. Uh, now, here is something we call in mathematics, everybody heard of a right triangle. The leg of a right triangle, the Pythagorean theorem, how they do. And the interesting thing is that when we talk about a right triangle, someone said, what about that mathematician when, who said, you don't know whether or not what you're talking about or whether or not it's true. Here's the, here's the, the square of the hypotenuse plus the sum of the legs of the right triangle. Is it actually equal like that? In mathematics, we say you have to verify or prove something or deal with it. Now, we, uh, we, we want to show you something very quickly. And I'm going to have Professor Dave to join me up here to go through this so that we can uh, show you very quickly why I'm convinced that Euclid was right about the, uh, I told them not to call me today. I was off. Yeah, I was off. <laughs> and they called anyway. Okay. Yeah. Now, we're going to let <laughs> Professor Dave very quickly tell you why, uh, how the, how to deal with the, the right triangle to prove that it is. As I mentioned before, when we initially learned the Pythagorean theorem, there are very elegant ways to prove that the theorem is true. And now that we know how to calculate area, we are ready to perform one such proof ourselves. Let's say we draw a right triangle like this one and label the sides A, B, and C, like we are used to. Now let's make three more copies of this triangle and arrange them like this so that we get two squares. The larger square has a side length of A plus B while the smaller inner square has a side length of C. We can calculate the areas of all of these shapes. We know that the area of one of the triangles will be one half base times height, or one half A times B. The area of the large square 
will be the side length squared, or a plus b quantity squared. And the small square will have an area of c squared. Now let's set up a relationship between these areas. The area of the large square is equal to a plus b quantity squared, as we just said. But it is also equal to the area of the small square plus the area of all the triangles, since these shapes comprise the larger square. So we can make an equation that states the following. a plus b quantity squared, the area of the big square, is equal to 4 times 1 half ab, which is 4 times the area of one triangle, since there are four triangles, plus c squared, the area of the small square. We know how to square a binomial by using the FOIL method. So let's take away the exponent and just write the binomial out twice. First gives us a squared, outer gives us ab, inner gives us ab, and last gives us b squared. Combining like terms, that's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. On the right, we can multiply 4 and 1 half, and we get 2ab plus c squared. As it happens, we have 2ab on both sides, so those will cancel out. And wouldn't you know it, take a look at what we are left with, the Pythagorean theorem. And that's the proof of it. Now, do you I hope this result makes you feel no. <laughs> like this. Now, for you, um, are what math is really all about. But uh, there are many other proofs. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, I want to hire you for five minutes. <laughs> no. Let's say we draw a right triangle <laughs> and label the side. Now he wants eight. extra money. Make <laughs> <laughs> three more copies of this triangle and arrange them like this, so that we get two squares. Now, but I tell professors, you know, we like to have chalk and a board and things, and like we're a sage on the stage and going through that, and then a student comes back to that, what did you say yesterday? If you do a video on nice things like this, I tell the student, hey, go back and watch the video again. You don't understand, you have a classmate, watch it with him, you know, he helped you understand that, but I'm not going to spend my office hours with you going over that lesson. If you missed class, you missed it. But you can go get it out of the file, the video file. And you can learn the math without asking me to teach extra like Professor Dave tried to get me to pay him extra. <laughs> now, so, but did you see? Did you see how nicer that proof was laid out? And even the non-math majors could appreciate it. So those of you who have not gotten an affinity for math, then we understand, but you, you, you will make it. Now, what we want to show you now is this. That was the Pythagorean uh, theorem that we just proved. Now, there's another one of my favorite pieces in mathematics that are called the Pascal Triangle. Why do I love the Pascal Triangle? Is this how this thing jumped over? It shouldn't have been over there. That point of thought, I put it in a box over there and jumped out of the box, but I stopped wrestling with it. Now, there's a fascinating thing here called uh, the Pascal Triangle. Because it gives you so much of a rich man if you learn that triangle. And so let's see if we help you learn a lot of rich math right quick from the uh, from this Pythagorean, where well, you see the symmetry uh, a minute. But we want to show you this right quick, what we can do in helping you to understand the power of the Pascal triangle and the secrets of mathematics that it, it, it reveals to you. This may look like a neatly arranged stack of numbers, but it's actually a mathematical treasure trove. Indian mathematicians called it the staircase of Mount Meru. In Iran, it's the Kainam Triangle, and in China, it's Yangwei's Triangle. To much of the Western world, it's known as Pascal's Triangle. 
after French mathematician Blaise Pascal, which seems a bit unfair since he was clearly late to the party, but he still had a lot to contribute. So what is it about this that has so intrigued mathematicians the world over? In short, it's full of patterns and secrets. First and foremost, there's the pattern that generates it. Start with one and imagine invisible zeros on either side of it. Add them together in pairs and you'll generate the next one. Now do that again and again. Keep going and you'll wind up with something like this. Though really, Pascal's triangle goes on infinitely. Now, each row corresponds to what's called the coefficients of a binomial expansion of the form x plus y raised to the n, where n is the number of the row, and we start counting from zero. So if you make n equal 2 and expand it, you get x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. The coefficients, or numbers in front of the variables, are the same as the numbers in that row of Pascal's triangle. You'll see the same thing with n equals 3, which expands to this. So the triangle is a quick and easy way to look up all of these coefficients. But there's much more. For example, add up the numbers in each row, and you'll get successive powers of 2. Or, in a given row, treat each number as part of a decimal expansion. In other words, row 2 is 1 times 1 plus 2 times 10 plus 1 times 100. You get 121, which is 11, squared. And take a look at what happens when you do the same thing to row 6. It adds up to 1,771,561, which is 11 to the 6th, and so on. There are also geometric applications. Look at the diagonals. The first two are very interesting. All ones, and then the positive integers, also known as natural numbers. But the numbers in the next diagonal are called the triangular numbers, because if you take that many dots, you can stack them into equilateral triangles. The next diagonal has the tetrahedral numbers, because similarly, you can stack that many spheres into tetrahedra. Well, how about this? Shade in all of the odd numbers. It doesn't look like much when the triangle is small, but if you add thousands of rows, you get a fractal known as series <coughs> this triangle. This triangle isn't just a mathematical work of art. It's also quite useful, especially when it comes to probability and calculations in the domain of combinatorics. Say you want to have five children and would like to know the probability of having your dream family of three girls and two boys. In the binomial expansion, that corresponds to girl plus boy to the fifth power. So we look at the row five, where the first number corresponds to five girls, and the last corresponds to five boys. The third number is what we're looking for. Ten out of the sum of all the possibilities in the row. So ten over thirty-two, or thirty-one point two five percent. Or if you're randomly picking a five-player basketball team out of a group of twelve friends, how many possible groups of five are there? In combinatoric terms, this problem would be phrased as 12 choose 5, and could be calculated with this formula. Or you could just look at the sixth element of the row 12 on a triangle and get your answer. The patterns in Pascal's triangle are a testament to the elegantly interwoven fabric of mathematics, and it's still revealing fresh secrets to this day. For example, Mathematicians recently discovered a way to expand it to these kinds of polynomials. What might we find next? Well, that's up to you. Well, this is why I say mathematics is it cultivates strategies for stimulating for that causes the mind to engage in problem solving. Now, sometimes we teach a whole course for people to learn those things. You know, hey, go back and go over my video. Look at it. You can, you can learn a lot about it. And it also will start you thinking about some things you might be able to do with this. Now, the other thing that we want to do, and we want to move quickly to get through this, this suspense this triangle that we just told you about. Um, it's fascinating. But you also can have. Uh, 
In addition to a Suspensky uh, triangle, you can have a Suspensky pyramid. Now I'm going to show you about how we can go inside of this thing. And it is a fractal. And the thing about fractal is you can do an infinite amount of internal things, making them smaller and smaller, and they're going to all have similar shapes. And they're going to have very convoluted edges around them. They're not going to be those small, smart triangles and other things you've done before. So we deal with that. So since we introduced you to it, we're going to let you first see how the Pascal triangle is inside, the suspensus triangle is inside the Pascal triangle. So this is the way it's being created. This is the Pascal you just saw. And we're going to create to show that the suspensus, that suspensus triangle is going to jump out of it. Now, here's the suspense kiss dream. We have this suspense kiss pyramid. Now, when we talk about similarity, as at every scale level, the low it get, all the things look similar to the original thing. And look at what's happening here. And you can go inside of this thing and see all those little similarities. And we have actually algorithms that can generate these things and you can actually see what's inside. Right. On whatever scale, however small you go, and we do them in iterations, and we can do you know, 150,000 iterations or millions or what have you. There's no end to the number of iterations we do. We did one fractal, we went through 750 million iterations. Now that takes a little time, but you saw all of the similarities at the minute scale, whatever scale level that be. You, you saw that. <laughs> now, what we want to do now so we can help you get out of here and, and get to something else, we want to just show you a couple, three more things and see can we go. Now, here's this we're going back now to this <laughs> mandel brock right. You see how if whether you go in and look like it did at the beginning, small and smaller the scale, it replicates what you had from the beginning. And these are the things we call practice to do in a very nice way. And uh, <laughs> Where you move in there? Or you're going to see these replication of the whole at every level. And they can generate beautiful pictures. and how it create all these strange, convoluted pictures that go about. We can take even plants or trees and leaves or coastlines and things, come up with a fractal shape of them and generate those over and over again to see what happens. And that's real beautiful. And that's right. They can't do it in most of those other stuff. They can't do this for you. So come on over and back with us so you can join the beauty and see how we solve problems in a very nice and fascinating way. And at least you say they showed me something beautiful before 
They put me out of that class, or before they let me out of the class, they don't put them out of the class. Uh, they let them out. We graciously tell them how they go out of the class. Now, the a research investigation, as my professor told me, you got to find a problem to solve. You know, and, and what most of the things we deal with in solving those problems, we go out and do the following. We ask the question is, we look at something, uh, and we say, hey, wait a minute, what can we do today to alter it or to do something new? Because you have to come up with some new mathematics. And what I what I like to call it is, is the what if problem. Uh, what if I change that? How many people know how many new geometers came about from Euclidean geometry when they said, let's play with this parallel line? What if we change that? What happens? You get new mathematics. You get new things. You get new ideas that they go through. And so this is what uh, you get an opportunity to do when you do research investigation. You, you learn all these different things about the different data and different things. Now, let me share something with those of you who, for example, it was discovered last year, the largest prime yet that we have can identify. Somebody said, why don't you, that matter? Well, somebody has a conjecture that there's an infinite number of primes out here. <laughs> but we don't know what they are. <laughs> So people want to know, if I run into a prime, I want to make sure you it's a prime. You know what's the most, one of the most fascinating things that bothers me about life? I hear so much fake truth and fake news. I don't know what the absolute truth is if I run into it. <laughs> so I don't listen to any of them. I follow the laws of mathematics. And go ahead and create things that I want to create and do the things I want to do that's wholesome. And don't worry about their opinion on these things. Now, there's something called the mathematics subject classification. Did you know in 2010 they have two, they had 47 pages of all these classifications where they got people who've done things in mathematical review, Zonka Bloss, and all the other places where they put that pictures in and wrote that book. 47 pages of classification, not entities, not pieces of work, of just different area of classification. Someone said, well, what kind of space you in? So I'm in a bar of space. No, I'm in this kind of space. What kind of plan? I'm in a machine plan. I'm going to figure all these classifications out there. So you can go through and deal with it. Now, so it's getting to be a bit hectic out there now. But this classification, when you're looking for new problems to investigate or do, it helps you to know what has already happened and what people are saying are open problems or might can happen. Now, something happened this year that I thought was fascinating. Uh, the, you had this uh, ancient mathematician, Diophantus from Alexandria. He has the Diophantian equation. Somebody this year solved the equation of x of x to the third plus y to the third plus z to the third is equal to 33. Hadn't they solved before? They solved this year. And there are a lot of things out there people don't know and they haven't solved. And so don't, don't be frightened if you have to go out and find your own problem. There are a lot of problems out here. You, you probably would, this is the one, that's the problem they solved when King was 33. And it was fascinating for them to be able to do that this year. And I was happy to see them come through. Now, when much of what you're doing now, you, you need to know something about computer science, I'm convinced. Uh, my professor was a group theorist, Eugene Shanker. And Marshall Hall was a great group theorist and I gave my, they were trying to classify all finite groups. And they were counting. We got one over here, three over here. I said, and somebody told me, you're going to die before you get through your fingers enough. 
And people understood that they had to learn computation. They had to learn computer software. And the thing that is nice now for folks, people who are doing research, is that not only do you need to learn some of these softwares to do your mathematical investigation, but a lot of the software is on the way of it's what we call open source software. It's free. You can go out there and learn it, use it, and uh, don't have to worry about buying special machine or uh, a special thing. And this is just some of the software that's out there that people are using frequently to help solve problems and do things on there. Now, but what I really find fascinating now for persons who are doing research investigation here that um, there is there is this package here out there now. This package right here called Warframe Math World. Young man, math genius, really. He got a baccalaureate from Cornell, GC from Caltech. He has been doing he's he been doing math since he was in ninth grade. Coming up with great things, don't he? And he has put it the most extensive mathematical resource for researchers and teachers on the way up, free of charge. And all you have to do is go to this site right here, the Math World site, and click it on. And you can find anything you want to about mathematics that you haven't learned yet, or like some of us, you didn't understand when you thought you had learned, and you went back to clarify and make it go. He's done over 13,000 entries out there as to how things go and make everything well. And he has it in almost every subject that you want to find it in out there, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. So I invite you to go out there if you're going to look at this and, and go out there to see what is going on. And young man, guess what? Guess what he was born? 1960. Here in Indiana. Not, not, he, he, he's not a German, he's not a Chinese, he's not a, an American. Right here. And he made this great resource available for anybody who wants to do, improve their teaching or to do research. He made all these things available out there for you to just go through. And he has this math world classroom. If you don't know how to teach your class as well, you can go out there and use this thing. Use this resource. He helped you get lessons straight so students can understand it and won't go back behind your back and say, I don't know what he's talking about. You know, you know if I get another professor next semester. No, 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 no. You got resources now to help you improve your teaching and to help you improve your investigation. Now, there are a lot of things that have happened out there since I've been teaching and enjoying mathematics. And it has been a fascinating journey for me. I've learned with the mathematics I know, the mathematics I learn as I go along, I have come to see real constructive thinking, real human in life, real thing. It has done to open so much of the minds that what have you. Incidentally, let me go back and tell you about Eric Weissman. I was in Fred and I studied mathematics for a year. The physics of mathematics of the couple of professors, show a person, the Nicolas Bubla, Bubaki. They had a they had what they call a Bubaki society in France. What's a Bubaki society? They would get the best minds in mathematics together and pay them during the summer to get together and the, all, the algebraists, and they're right out of They weren't competing and selling these cheap books out here nobody understood. They wrote a very good, they did like Eric Blackman, and then they made it available to everybody. The book by Peace Society. And it was one of the most fascinating years of study that I've ever had. You know, the Bubaki. And I remember I used to go down to Basel in Switzerland where Leonard Orla was to, uh, because I was in Strasbourg, so I, I was on the line, I could go all over Europe and do these things. Now, but anyway, mathematics 
is one of the most superior things that you can have in your mind what you do. We're closer in two minutes. <laughs> Here's what's happening. There are people who look at them watch from the side of the wall. Uh, I want to ask, I want to ask you, I want to ask the, the people in the audience, do you know how many people recognize the name Benjamin Barrett? How many people recognize the name of uh, Reverend Sean? Know what's interesting about them? Neither one of them had a formal education. Neither one of them were taught in formal ways. But both of them end up in history being great mathematicians. Benjamin Banneker was the first African-American scientist and mathematician whose papers were accepted by the Mathematical Society in London. Americans wouldn't accept it because of his race. But he got him accepted. He did, he solved problems in the almanac. He proved theorems in mathematics that had not been proved before. And he didn't even have a formal education. He didn't know what school was. But there were strategies that caused his mind, engaged his mind to solve problems. Now, uh, the, so this is the thing that uh, is of interest here. This man here was an Indian. He never went to school, never had to go to school. People rejected his paper, wouldn't work with it. He worked in isolation. But when somebody took time to look at him, he said, this man's a genius. This man's doing math. We haven't been able to figure out. We have not been able to figure out. Yeah. So everybody can do math. People can like math as you want to go and make everything go. They can make it go well. And today we're honoring James L. Solomon because he broke a barrier at the University of South Carolina. He came in and studied what no other African American has studied before especially in the area not there. And so I am appreciative that the University of South Carolina joined the right side of history and led him in and have continued to embrace African American students who have good minds and want to study mathematics. And so I came down here because I want to encourage them to continue to do this. I want to even challenge them. Uh, at the University of Michigan, they have a Marjorie Brown lecture every February during Black History Month, because she was the first African-American woman who got a PhD from Michigan. And they, they said, we've done something. We want to keep it going, and we want people to know it. I'm going to challenge the University of South Carolina to have an annual lecture or one every biannual one every two years for James L. Salt to increase the production of the number of mathematicians. Look at these numbers that are built. The first black man got a PhD in mathematics. The first black man got a PhD in mathematics in 1925, Ever Cox. Between 1925 and 1960, only 30 more African Americans earned PhD in the United States. During 1961, 1970, 510 earned PhDs in math here. And between 1976 and 90, only 115 earned. And the uh, also, and between 1991 and 2000, only 100 earned in about two. 2001 to 2015, only about 115 earned. We have a total of less than 500 blacks with PhD in this country. And that 500 represents less than 1% of all the American mathematicians, white American mathematicians 
we get. And we raise the question. We're talking about equity. We're talking about getting good minds because we need a diverse society. We need a society where all good minds are cultivated and we take them to the highest limit and take them forward. I'm proud of the fact that University of South Carolina brought in Mr. Solomon. I'm proud of the fact, and would you stand, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Knox, that they brought in Dr. Knox, who earned a PhD here at the University of South Carolina. Uh, I <coughs> know a Dr. Ron Patterson, who earned a PhD here in uh, mathematics at the University of South Carolina. And I know a young lady, and I should have written down her name, who also earns. Campus. Yes, there is. Who earned a PhD here? But since 1925, only three. I tell God he's the university that I can find. I think one every five years is worth it. I think that would be nice to pursue it, though. Still, and the issue is what bothers me many times more than anything else. We can bring people here from India, from China, from all kinds of countries. They can't even speak English, and we say, "Oh, they have a good mind. We're teaching mathematics. How can you teach them mathematics? They don't know English yet." But you do it. You cultivate them because you embrace them, and so we're going to give them a chance. African Americans need that same chance. And need to be done the same way. I went down to the University of Puerto Rico and I was pleased with their model. They said, you can teach here, but if you don't speak fluent Spanish in three years, you're gone. I don't care what your mind looks like. Because we want you to communicate with our students. And so I'm challenging the University of, I'm thanking the University of South Carolina for what they got started with, and I'm challenging them to take it to the next level. And I wish to thank you for honoring Mr. Solomon, Mr. James L. Solomon, Sr. And I want to thank you for having this special event and this honor and inviting me to participate in it because I'm on a mission. Nam has been here for 50 years where we are cultivating the development of excellence in mathematics, and we're also cultivating development of African Americans reaching their highest height in power. Years ago, I had the honor of meeting Catherine, uh, meeting Catherine Goble Johnson. I was up at NASA. I went up there and we met. And I had worked with the government and they wouldn't let me talk about what we did. So I didn't ask her what she was doing because I had to have a top clearance in order to do what I was doing. And I knew she had to have a clearance. I never knew what she was doing. But when I found out what she was doing, it blew my mind. And those of you who want to know, I wrote an article about her in the mathematical notices that came out this March, last month, read about Catherine Thompson. John Glenn said, I'm not going up there in that plane unless she verifies <laughs> that these figures are right. And she had an excellent mind, and he cultivated. And that's all we ask. Cultivate all excellent minds. Black, white, blue, or polka dot. Cultivate them because. American needs it, the world needs if we're going to make the kind of society that we need to be. Thank you for inviting me. I thank you for coming to attend the lecture. I thank you for not going to sleep on me. <laughs> and I thank you for having interest in elevating more African Americans to get the best possible education they can. And the way we have to watch this now, Nam did something that we can't continue to do. 
there's only one black research institution that awards PhDs in mathematics, that's our university. But there are 125 white research institutions in America that award PhDs in mathematics. And I was started in 1976, and most of those I've been to have awarded two, three, or four. Now, Howard's in double figures and move. Join Howard. Again, thank you.